I'm Leslie, and this is a podcast about the hobbies where misfits belong. It's niche to meet you. Christmas movie binges have begun in our house. My favorite? Well, as if I could decide. There's It's a Wonderful Life. Of course, we watch that on Christmas Eve and weep. There's Elf, which in my opinion is best viewed at the very beginning of the season. There's A Charlie Brown Christmas and Miracle on 34th Street and <laughs> Die Hard and Oh Malone 1 and 2 and Rudolph and that's really only scratching the surface. But you know what my favorite one might be and I'm going to ask you to please hold your judgment. It's Christmas with the Cranks because it's a ridiculous story. Over the top, bonkers, stupid, hilarious, but stupid until the end. And, and I'll let you watch it for yourself, but if you're prone to get angry about spoilers, just scoot ahead a little bit, because I think the most profound character in that movie is the guy who plays Santa. The actor is Austin Pendleton, who, interestingly, originated the role of model in the first Broadway production of Fiddler on the Roof. Okay, the gag of this Santa character is adorable. This guy shows up to a neighborhood Christmas party very familiar with everyone, knows the kids, the parents, indicates he's watched everyone grow up, and no one knows who he is. But they don't say anything, because he's obviously so comfortable and welcome. You find out at the end, he's the Santa. He's the guy who dresses up every Christmas, who, year by year, from behind a white beard and fuzzy hat, watches the kids grow up and grow out and leave their parents behind. The character trope of the guy who plays Santa is in most Christmas movies. He's the guy telling Ralphie he'll shoot his eye out. He's the guy walking to his ramshackle car while smoking in Home Alone. He's the grizzled and grumpy old guy in need of Buddy the Elf's help. Or he's the gentle and kind man in a courtroom defending his identity. The dad who gained 50 pounds overnight from handling a business card found in an empty Santa suit. The guy playing Santa is a character unto himself. And you know, these people exist in real life, too. And I wondered, who are they? Well, I hope you've been nice this year. Go ahead and grab your Christmas list. Step in line, because here comes Santa Claus. Santa came to say. If you couldn't tell from the exquisitely delivered ho ho hos, that's a room full of Santas and Mrs. Clauses singing Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. I joined the Middle Tennessee Professional Santa Group on a rainy Saturday in October for their last monthly gathering of the year before their schedules are filled with donning red suits and attending parties, events, and private homes as Santa Claus. Within this group are ex-military Santas, realtor Santas, black belt Santas, radio DJ Santas, former educator Mrs. Clauses, and they're all devoted to the profession of embodying the spirit of Christmas. The largest portion of this launch was spent on hearing recent Santa school graduates talk about their time at the famed C.W. Howard Santa School. The granddaddy of them all for Santa schools is the Charles W. Howard School, some people call it the C.W. Howard School. Coming in? It's the world's oldest Santa <clears throat> school. World's oldest, and started in 1937? In New York, yes. Now beyond New York. And uh, C.W. Howard was kind of started, right? Oh, and here's an important note about the school. There's cookies, and I don't mean like a plate of cookies. I'm talking about, there was what, about eight, eight foot tables? <laughs> From front to back, there was cookies. All kinds of cookies. And you come out on break, and there's those eight, eight foot tables that are full of cookies. And you go back in, and you come back out on break, and the cookies have, have multiplied. <laughs> cookies. If one were to make a meme with that format of Santa starter pack, there would surely be cookies present. Cookies and fireplaces and snow and a sleigh and reindeer and Coca-Cola. Taken out of context, that's a wild assortment of nouns. How did Santa become Santa? How did all these things come together? It's these sorts of things that keep me awake at night and I could Google it or 
I could ask my friend and historian, Stephanie Fulbright, to tell me more. Turns out, it all starts with the legends of a saint named Nicholas. Who is a 4th century bishop in Myra who dies generally around December 6th. And this will become important because ultimately his feast day will become December 6th. But Nicholas is known for a number of things. There's all these legends about, you know, his austerity as a baby. He wouldn't nurse on Wednesdays or Fridays because he was fasting, I guess. Very, very smart infant or very, very, very dedicated infant. There's also a story of him helping out a man who had three daughters and didn't have enough money for the dowry to marry his daughters off. And so the daughters were facing kind of a choice of starvation or prostitution. And so this happened three times, what kind of one, once with each daughter, they each faced this crisis. And every time Nicholas dropped off a bag of gold in secret. Hmm. And so we can already see the foundations here of somebody who brings good gifts But Nicholas becomes to be known as the patron saint of sailors and merchants, repentant thieves and prostitutes, children, brewers, pawnbrokers, and students. And so he's got a very uh, wide swath of folks that he's looking out for, but the big ones here is, is going to be children. And this idea that we see this history of giving gifts, we have a particular attachment to children, but also, again, this idea of kind of defender of the faith. You've played the game of telephone, I'm sure. That thing where the phrase makes its way through whispers down a line of folks, and the last person says the phrase out loud to reveal that through the course of its journey, the message has evolved and changed, left to the devices of each transmitter. St. Nicholas was subject to the same phenomenon. Throughout Europe, St. Nicholas and his gift-giving and children watching and faith-defending congeal into various traditions. So, for example, in the Netherlands, Sinterklaas would visit once a year and quiz children and adults on Bible trivia. If you passed the impromptu Bible quiz, you'd get a little gift. And if not, you would either get beaten or put in a bag and taken to hell by Black Pete, St. Nick's evil assistant. Now, we're not going to explore Black Pete any further. We're going to leave that there. But as the years pass, the extremes of this tradition pass as well. As time goes on, though, the consequences for not getting your Bible trivia right tend to become a little bit less and less severe until eventually you just get coal. Hmm. You just get a non-gift instead of being beaten and dragged to hell. Well, Aha! So, so enters coal into on? the Christmas yes. narrative. Yes. So we've got St. Nicholas doing these things, but again, St. Nicholas is Catholic. And so Protestant Germany then has this conundrum as they become Protestant, which is, in some ways, this is kind of a beloved tradition. So you can't just get rid of St. Nicholas altogether, but you can't keep him because he's Catholic. So instead, they introduce the idea of Christ Kindle, or the Christ Child, who visits children on Christmas Eve, and it spiritualizes gift giving. The Christ Child has come to give you this gift. So we just moved gift giving from St. Nicholas Day, so December 6th, to now December 24th. Ah. And the Christ child comes to be represented as a little girl in a white dress. So if you're familiar with German Christmas decorations, if you see a little girl in a white dress with angel wings and a crown, that is the Christ kindle, the Christ child representation. But that still wasn't quite as appealing. So in popular imagination, they just have the Christ child start to go around with St. Nicholas on December 24th because St. Nicholas had kind of was so embedded in the the lore of the Christmas. lore yeah that the Christ child starts going around with St. Nicholas on Christmas Eve and along with St. Nicholas depending on where you are in Europe may some other folk people may get subbed in and out so there's a old man winter in Finland father christmas In England, all of these names that we have that kind of become Santa Claus, they are a old man figure who's doing things in December who becomes associated with Nicholas, and now we have Nicholas going around with the Christ Kindle. Okay, so there's that. So Saint becomes Santa. I can see that. How about Claus? 
Well, generally what happens is there's an immigration of both Dutch and German folks into New York. And the English-speaking folks have, a lot of these words are unfamiliar to them and they haven't heard them before. So Christ Kindle starts to sound like Chris Kringle and Sinsterklaas, which is Saint Nick or Saint Nicholas, becomes Santa Claus. Sinsterklaas. Yeah. So Klaus is the Nick Klaus. Nick yes. Klaus. Okay. Yes. And Chris, Christer, you said Christer Kinder? Christ Kindle becomes Christ. Christ Kindle, Chris Kringle. Yeah. Ah! Yep. So it's a bad, essentially it's a bad transliteration oh. of all of these names. So now we have Saint Nick, Santa Claus, Chris Kringle. We're pulling in Old Man Winter and Father Christmas from other European traditions. <laughs> Yeah, that's a crock pot full of stuff. All meaning the same guy, same tradition, same night. But then, what is Christmas and Santa without some marketing, I ask you? How did this legend and character that scares children into behaving turn into a cultural icon, turn into a spokesperson for the most recognizable soft drink brand to turn someone folks spend thousands of dollars to portray? It starts with a little poem. So... Somebody publishes Twas the Night Before Christmas. What is unique within Twas the Night Before Christmas is we start to get some changes. So we get indication that Santa is small. There's some references about like the little man, which is a precursor to this idea of elves. Um, Santa has a sleigh, his reindeers with names coming on Christmas Eve. We have no indication that he's any sort of religious figure. He has twinkling eyes, red cheeks, Red nose, chubby. He's here's a gift giver, not as the Bible trivia announcer or presenter. And so this this changes us away from Saint Nicholas and starts to make Santa Claus be independent of the historical right. Saint Nicholas who who existed. So in the 1860s through 80s, Thomas Nast is. And a German-born illustrator who's moved to New York, and he's the one who's going to give us a lot of the images, mm. the visual images of what we associate with Santa Claus today. So twas, the night before Christmas told us that, that Santa had chubby cheeks and a red nose, but the pot-bellied, white-bearded gentleman with a sack over his shoulder in kind of a red uniform with white trim is coming from Thomas Nast. And so Thomas is working for Harper's Weekly, and he starts publishing these illustrations of Santa Claus between 1863 and 1888. He's just 33 of them in total. And along with that, based into his drawings, we start to add other things to the Santa myth. So headquarters of in the North Pole, the fact that he's a toy maker, that there's elves, that he receives letters, that he has his ledger of names, the idea of giving cookies for Santa, all come out of Thomas Nast's illustrations. So those really take off as a visualization. And now, now we have a picture of Santa. This then creates a market for the idea of going to visit Santa. Because now we know what Santa looks like, so we can replicate Santa. Our final leap is then with Coca-Cola. Haddon Sundblom, who's a Chicago-based commercial artist, who was hired by Coca-Cola to do Christmas ads for them. And between 1931 and 1964, so for 33 years, he did at least one Coca-Cola Santa ad a year. And that's where the red and white association with Santa really comes uh. in really strongly because there's the red colors for Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. And so he makes Santa kind of big again. It's with Sunblom and Coca-Cola that we start to get the, the fur trimmings and okay. the kind of soft plush mm. clothing that goes along with it. And so then thanks to just kind of general American marketing and exports, but also Coca-Cola, this image of Santa Claus then gets exported to the rest of the world. And that's how Santa Claus went viral. You're listening to a special teaser for the new podcast, Niche to Meet You. This show explores the niche, subcultures, and hobbies that are saving us from isolation and loneliness, and by extension, are actually saving our lives. We'll meet sci-fi tabletop wargamers, Rubik's Cube enthusiasts and competitors, 
dog sledding champions, Dungeons and Dragon dungeon masters, chess gossip followers, the list goes on and on. And you can listen to the trailer, which is a thesis for the entire show, wherever you find your podcast or at niche to meet you dot show. And if you really want to be supportive, text two friends right now. Literally just say, hey, I'm really excited about this new show. It's coming in January. You should listen. Thanks for doing that. Now, let's get back to this episode. Okay, back to the Santa lunch. There's a lot of chuckling and merriment at this gathering, which, you know, it's to be expected. We're talking about Santa here, but what I didn't expect was how serious they were about this endeavor. The reasons for their devotion to this character are varied, but a lot of them sound similar to Santa Ben's. Santa Ben is a relatively new Santa, and he joined me from his workshop over Zoom, complete with a backdrop of a fireplace with piles of gifts. And he's in his Santa garb. It's casual. It's not the red suit. It's a vest and a white shirt. And he's sitting about six feet from the mic, lounging in a very North Pole-style looking chair. Well, my granddaughter started all this. She was just a, an infant, and I wanted to be able to see Santa, so and I went ahead and got all decked out in the garb right in front of her so she could see me do it with a fake beard. And that started it, the physical part right there. That's the easy answer. I joined the Junior Chamber of Commerce many years ago. And they do a lot of fundraising things. We raised some money, and uh, we use that for... Uh, Thanksgiving baskets, you know, take children out for Christmas. So we all had a child to bring to Walmart. I can't tell you anything about it except that it was a girl, and she wanted a coat. That's all she wanted was a coat. A coat. And I couldn't even do the checkout. I had to leave out of the store. I was, I was torn up. It, it, it was like a calling, you know. I, I, don't, I hate to use that kind of wording, but it was in me, and... It changed me, <laughs> more forgiving, more charitable, and more, uh, you know, everything. But it all stems from that little tipping point, and I got that taste of, wow, that, that wild taste that you get when you go to McDonald's and you buy for somebody behind you. Santa Ben was one of the C.W. Howard Santa School graduates that spoke at the lunch I went to. Yeah, he's a newbie. Though he's already well on his way to looking the part, he's got stark white hair and is growing a big old beard, and his mustache is supreme. He's ex-military, played football, and this guy couldn't stop crying when he went to his first Santa school experience. And the first and foremost impactful thing I got to tell you guys is this, and it's a tough one. Uh, it's a real tough one because people that know me, I'm ex-military, I play football, I play hockey, all this stuff, I don't cry. Not a crier. Half the time I was there, there were teardrops coming out of my eyes. I imagine he cried because he was hearing stories from other Santas that capture the importance of the work. If you spend any amount of time with these folks, they're quick to tell you these kinds of stories. Like Santa Shed. He's a Middle Tennessee black Santa who took up the role in 2020. After a year of racial conflict, Shed saw a need for brown skin Santa representation, and this story, he told me, explains very clearly why. My favorite story is this. Last year, I'm standing in the, uh, the Slim and Huskies location in Antioch, and families are coming through, and one family in particular comes up. It's a white lady, and then someone else about her age, so it's her sister, and then their mother, and then these little black children, she was a foster family, and they want to make sure they found uh, a Santa that represented their children in this foster family. She tells me they're from Fort Worth, Texas. Her sister lives in Antioch. And so they said, hey, we, we have two purposes for Christmas this year. One, we want our foster kids to meet our family, but two, we want to make sure they meet a black Santa. And so they came out from Fort Worth. At the Santa lunch, Mrs. Claus Scarlett and Santa Wade shared this story. We talked about some stories. One of the, the toughest stories that Wade had last year was a mother who called for a home visit. 
and she finally told Wade after Christmas they were getting a divorce. And so she wanted to make this, the Christmas special for the kids this year. That's some pressure on you, Sabbaths. Um, you know, but she bought a toy and, and we prayed about it. And he actually said when he left, Mother hugged him and she was shaking. See, below the surface of the specific circumstances for each individual Santa's entry into Santa portrayal artistdom, that's what they call it, there's an underlying awareness of deep societal despair. They, much like public servants, see deeper than just the faces, they see the heart. It's about the spirit. You have to have the spirit. And Charles W. Howard, who started that school, um, you know, he's famous for his, his, his phrase that says, he heirs who thinks Santa enters through the chimney. Santa enters through the heart. I think it's easy to assume that the people who take up the red suit do it just because they love kids or they're in need of attention or need a job and think it's easy or maybe even worse reasons than those. At least that's how Christmas movies portray them. But these Santas, these real life santa portrayal artists at least put on their jolly appearance and finely manicure their white beards because they recognize and feel compelled to do something about the darkness in the world a darkness that can only be pushed back by everything christmas means uh, and, and my goodness and i'll stop preaching just a second my goodness if there was ever time when everyone we meet needs a smile yes. and right. needs to laugh and needs to be reassured. Am I the only one who feels so terrible? No, you're not the only one who feels so terrible. But my goodness, there is hope, there is joy, and there's an awful lot of fun doing what we do, embodying who we embody and spreading Christmas cheer. Now, uh, the offering will, won't occur momentarily. <laughs> For some, this is a spiritual endeavor. It's their way to literally embody the reason for their own Christmas celebrations, even going so far as to call it a ministry. It is a, it is a ministry for us. And yes. the thing is, is I always tell everybody, I say, this is what God says to you and he wants you to understand. You must love every human being on this entire earth, for I love them all, for they are my creation. No, Santa is a place where everybody can come and feel loved. There's no discrimination. It doesn't matter what your story is, your background. It's just a way to love people without any barriers. Regardless of the reason, it all has a purpose for them. The $2,000 suits, the trips to Santa schools, which they're encouraged to do every year, by the way. This is more than just a hobby. It's a calling. It's a lifestyle. To bring joy to kids from 1 to 92. What I got in it for was to bring joy to everyone. I mean, it's almost indescribable the joy that you see on the kids' faces when they just explode with laughter and, and smiling and just they can't wait to, you know, hug Santa. And it, it's amazing how much joy that, that, that you see in the little kids, as well as adults. Years and years and years ago, I don't know when or what date it was, but I'm sure I was seeing exactly what I just described to you at an event. And I looked at my wife and I told her, I said, when I retire, from my full-time gig, I want to be a Santa Claus. I'm going to be Santa, and I'm going to bring the Christmas spirit to all of these kids just like this, just like this moment. It's a beautiful thing, is it not? Knowing that the Santas at your work gathering in your local parade, the ones behind the beard winking at you from under the white fur trim, they care deeply about their role of being the embodiment of the spirit of Christmas. 
In a season where marketing and sales are the driving force of public conversation and celebration, it seems a humble undertaking to put on a red suit and sit among both the joyous celebration and the pain that hides beneath the surface of it because you can't have a human experience without both. The guy holding your child on his knee, the professional Santa portrayal artists of the world, take up this hobby and endure the crying and the snotty noses and the endless quirks of children because they want to bring joy to the human heart where it might be missing. Perhaps even, and maybe especially, in yours. Give me a ho! Ho! ho. Give me a ho ho! Ho ho! Give me a ho ho ho! You've been listening to a special holiday episode and teaser for the new podcast, Niche to Meet You, where we explore niche subcultures and hobbies that are saving our lives. I'm Leslie Thompson, and I'm glad you were here. Merry Christmas.